should historians engage with films or in, ignore them as they did for a long time? Since films are integral to media, which shapes public history, historians cannot ignore them. Although historians remain divided, as they usually are in the choice of sources and methods, the realization that professional history can ignore films at its peril dawned upon some film historians in the 1930s. Since then, film history has grown as a discipline steadily in some countries, which ironically excludes India, which produces the largest number of films in the world. This presentation with Professor Anirudh Deshpande is about the possible questions and methods which historians must address in their engagement with film as history and source of history. Now, who is Professor Anirudh Deshpande? Anirudh Deshpande was actually a speaker with us and I'm bringing him on board. Good evening, sir. How are you? Good evening. I'm fine. Thank you very much for having me again. All right. So wonderful to have you. So uh, Professor Anirudh Deshpande is um, at the Department of History, Delhi University. He teaches not only modern and early modern Indian history, but also European history. He's also the author of a number of books, including the British Raj and its Indian Armed Forces, um, 1857 to 1939, which was published by OUP. His second book is on British military policy in India, 1900 to 1945, Colonial Constraints and Declining Power, and was published by Manohar. He's also the author of Class, Power and Consciousness in Indian Cinema and Television. This was published by Primus in 2009. So there are other books, The First Line of Defense, Glorious 50 Years of the Border Security Force, BSF, There's Hope and Despair, Mutiny Rebellion, and Death in India. And then, of course, the recently published and interesting, the very interesting book, um, The Practice of History, Essays in Search of the New Past, which was published by Akar Books. So I think um, Dr. Razavi has insisted that everyone reads this book as well. Now, there are other, like, other 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 things that he has done there are academic papers commentaries reviews and numerous articles since 1987 in journals and newspapers such as the um uh, indian economic uh, review and social history review so studies in history and economic uh, epw and then of course there is journal of imperial and commonwealth history contemporary india book reviews and um lots of things are happening he's also a commentator on india's only bilingual journal forward press dedicated to social justice. Now, there are so many things. And um, if I start speaking all these things that I have on my bio um, for you, sir, it will take a lot more time. But I will let you have the floor now. And shall we talk about history and cinema? What exactly is the relationship? How much time do I have, Shavita? So you said five hours. About an hour. Okay, so you so said I, five. I, no, I just joked with you. I was saying when you said how many, how much would you like to speak? I would. I said five hours. I was kidding. I was kidding with you, <laughs> basically. You know, okay. <laughs> to make you laugh a little. So, uh, well, I mean, <clears throat> this is uh, uh, you know, this is uh, part of my. Uh, part of my personal, emotional, and uh, academic and historical engagement with films, which goes back to my childhood, uh, from when I really thought, and I actually, <clears throat> I used to, uh, I used to be fascinated by films. Some of my friends who are, uh, you know, who, who discuss films with me and who, with whom we have a constant, uh, 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 you know, interaction on film music or, you know, the film genres or, you know, directors and so on and so forth. Uh, they are all my fellow travelers. So these are, you know, uh, what I'm going to do today is to share a few ideas uh, with my listeners uh, about uh, what possible relationship can there be between uh, cinema and the historian or, as you can put it, the other way around film and history i would like to <clears throat> begin my presentation with what dw griffith who had uh, who produced one of the first uh, one of the first cinema magnums called the birth of a nation which is basically a history of the united states uh, 
as it uh, as it came out of the civil war of 1861 to 65 and this became a very important film uh, in the american audiences uh, self perception of themselves as americans and this film uh, this film amongst uh, you know other such as the uh, uh, the, the 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 westerns and other other genres of uh, genres of film which actually celebrated uh, uh, the so-called pioneering spirit of the Americans and so on and so forth. They all these films actually began to play a very important role. They in fact played a very important role at least in the first uh, 20, 30 years uh, in forming the uh, you know in forming the modern conception and the modern identity of Americans. Uh, and as A.D.P. Taylor was very fond of saying, you know, the films had become, you know, they had become a social habit by the 1930s and 40s when the, when cinema halls were operating in most Western cities and the cinema halls had started operating in, in the colonies and the influence of film and the cinematograph in a variety of ways began to spread from America and from France and from England and other countries into the, into the, into those countries who would later on be called the third world, including India, where the uh, where also the film industry uh, began to, you know, Indian film industry is of course almost as old as the uh, Hollywood uh, film industry, and uh, we have the first films coming out in the, you know, uh, in the in almost uh, coterminous with the Great War period, and uh, then of course you have the 1920s and 30s, the, the times of the silent movies, and so on and so forth, and after that, of course. So you have the talking system. So you have an entire history of cinema. And uh, D.W. Griffith very early uh, made a he made a prediction, and he said that uh, you know very soon in future a time would come when more. And of course, I mean this film, his film, the birth of the the birth of a nation, has been criticized as a you know as a, a <clears throat> as a defense of white America against uh, uh, you know against. Um, uh, Against an uh, against another America, which was which could have been possible as a consequence of the emancipation of slavery, but that's a different story altogether. Let's not be detained by that. And D. W. Griffith said one thing, which uh, which played a very important role in the way we began to look at cinema, especially historians began to look at cinema from the 1920s, 30s onwards. He said, in future, a time would come when uh, you know uh, when cinema archives would be the place where people would go, and uh, and read history. And how they would do it, they would go to this uh, cinema archives where every, where, you know, film reels would be kept in boxes and there would be projectors or other machines on which they would see this, these films and, you know, good films, historical film, films or social films or cultural films, other kinds of films would be available to them. And instead of spending Instead of spending hours in libraries poring over books and articles and you know peer-reviewed journals and so on, these people would then you know watch a well-informed good film and be acquainted with history in a matter of in, in a matter of two hours. For instance, I mean he would <clears throat> the example which he uh, he quoted was let's say he if somebody wanted to really somebody wanted to know. Uh, the history of, let's say, the Napoleonic Wars or the Battle of Waterloo. All he would do uh, or would be to, uh, you know, uh, basically to see a very good film, two or three films on the Battle of Waterloo, and be very well informed about, and very emotionally also uh, informed about uh, a very important great uh, historical event which which shaped European and world history in some ways. So very early, this uh, prediction was made, and a film appeared in the 19. I mean, it began to emerge, uh, especially in the interwar period, uh, from let's say 1919 to 1939. Film uh, uh, film emerged as a very important tool of uh, not only of history, of uh, of uh, you know showing people culture, showing them colonies. But it also emerged a very as a very important tool of state propaganda, which was used to great effect by fascist cinema, which uh, which developed after Mussolini came to power in Italy in 1922. And of course, we all know <coughs> how formed uh, his friend in Germany uh, was of films and how films were used by the Nazis uh, on a very large scale to 
<coughs> to you know to 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 propagate their ideology amongst the and brainwash the German people uh, uh, into you know uh, uh, into gaining their support for a very large uh, genocidal war which was perpetrated on Europe by the Nazis from 1939 onwards. So the impact of film uh, was understood by a large number of people. Unfortunately, uh, the way history had developed since the 19th century um, was, was it started inveighing against the uh, inveighing against the seriousness with which film ought to have been understood by the historians right from the beginning. Of course, I'll, uh, to sum up, I mean, when I start summing up this presentation, I'll talk a little bit more about that. But right now, I would like to, <clears throat> I would like to, you know, I mean, I have, I have uh, in my first slide, which is. Uh, which I think you people can see. Uh, I have two positions on the film. The contemporary position is given by Robert uh, Brent Toplin, who's a film historian, well-known film historian. He very clearly says that gone are the days when professional historians turned up their noses at suggestions that films sometimes should figure prominently in discussions about the past. And then you have another a very important, uh, a very a methodological position on film taken by another film historian and, uh, you know, a historian of ideas, Justin Smith, who says film history must embrace the interdisciplinary openness which has enlivened other branches of social history. Films never exist in isolation and are always related, related to the wider cultural output of an era. So now let me come to a, a model which I have. <clears throat> which have prepared so for students and teachers who are interested in looking at cinema uh, from a historian's perspective, from the perspective of the, the historian's craft and the historical method. So this is the uh, triangulated model which I am presenting, a uh, triangulated model to understand the film. You'll find that uh, on this model, uh, you have on the top of, uh, uh, one at you know, one 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 point of the triangle makes up the filmmaker. So who's the filmmaker? The filmmaker is the director, the producer. Uh, there's a team. It is the filmmaker is the the filmmaker comprises a team of people, a collaborative collective exercise, which produces a commodity. In the same way as a factory produces a commodity. Or in the same way as a printer produces a book in which the writer, the printer, the publisher, they are all together. Similarly, uh, filmmaking is an industry. So we talk about the film industry uh, simply because the film industry produces a commodity. And this commodity is called cinema or film or documentaries or whatever you, you may prefer to call it, uh, you may videos or whatever. So who is who are the filmmakers? The filmmakers are film uh, film directors, producers, scriptwriters, screenplay writers, costume designers, financiers, uh, media analysts, advertisers, uh, film distributors, cinema uh, cinema hall owners, and so on. So for this is an entire entire structure which produces a commodity. At the other end, and there is an interaction between this process, this process which produces the commodity, and the consumer of the commodity. And who is the consumer of the commodity? The consumer of the commodity is the audience. The question which the the question which we ask of the audience is why does the audience like or dislike a film? Uh, and in this, we talk about what is called the emotional quotient of films. If if audiences love a film, why? Uh, if audiences flock to the theater uh, to a self, to see a film many times uh, and through interviews and through uh, newspaper reports and so on, we come to know, in fact, we have more information about how many people actually go to watch how many films. And you, you, I'm sure you've often heard of people who have watched a particular film 20 times or 18 times or 30 times or 40 times. And we, we ourselves keep watching some films all the time. So what is it about a film? which people like or dislike. And after that, we go to the question of why they dislike or like a film. So uh, remember one thing when we when we understand film, we, we must understand the first relationship. And that is the relationship between the filmmaker and the audience, because there is no commodity without the consumer of that commodity. And there is no consumer without a commodity. So if there is a film, there must be an audience. And if there is an audience, 
there must be a film. So there's a dialectical relationship between the film and its consumer, the audience. Then, of course, uh, the third corner is taken up by the historian who interacts with both these, uh, uh, both these uh, you know, elements of the entire film producing uh, and film consuming experience. So historian is, uh, the, if, if the historian, of course, I'm, I'm assuming that some historians are interested in cinema and they'd like to ask questions of cinema to be able to understand social and cultural history in the context of cinema better. The historians must question both these uh, both these aspects of filmmaking. He must question the filmmaker and he must also question the audience. He must be in dialectical relationship with both these uh, people, the filmmakers uh, as producer of the commodity, audiences as consumers of the commodity. Now, let me go to the questions which uh, must be asked by the film historians. And it is in the answering of these questions that uh, uh, it is when we look at the answers to these questions that we, number one, start asking more questions, which leads us to a deeper research of a particular topic on which cinema is made, which actually deepens our historical understanding of processes, which, of course, as film, as film, film view viewers, some of you might understand. The questions to be asked by the film historian is very, they are very, I've got about a series of, let's say, about eight questions, which the film film uh, which the film uh, film fil film historian has to ask of his subject uh, the first question is who are the film producers and directors are they men or women are they progressive or reactionary so let's say if you if you look at a film of the 1950s and you say let's say you want to look at uh, mughal azam uh, the first question which you have to ask is uh, who was kiasif what kind of films did he produce? Uh, why did he produce this film? Uh, what was his ideological orientation? Uh, whether this film was produced to showcase the uh, secular as secular nature of Indian history or whether it was a nation building film? What kind of film was this? So these are the questions which you have to ask. What is the perspective of the camera? The perspective of the camera depends upon who the filmmaker and film producer is the second obvious question is the topic for a film why is a particular topic for a film chosen if if a film director if a film team filmmaker team is producing a historical film why are they making a historical film it's not simply enough to understand what the film is conveying to you in terms of meaning or in terms of mythology or in terms of you know legend or in terms of actual, factual, correct, authentic history. I think uh, an equally important question to ask is uh, about the topic of the film. Why is that film being made uh, at a particular time when it is being made? It is the kind of question which we expect our research students to ask when they begin their uh, uh, when they begin their research degrees. And when people come and ask me, students, so. I always ask them, I, I, I always question them, query them. I ask them why they want to work on a particular topic. Because this question, why, is extremely important. And from this, uh, from this basically, uh, two uh, consequences follow. And since I consider all film political film, uh, the political exigency of a film. And the other question is, no film is apolitical. If you consider all films to be political, in the sense that all, all films relate to power in some way or the other, it could be cultural power, it could be social power, or it could be openly speaking political power, you have uh, you know, uh, the political agency within the film, political exigency within the film. So, And that is connected to the choice of the topic and the research which goes into making the film and of course the understanding of the audience which the filmmaker has so all these things are connected the third important question is what is the background of the filmmakers so when you when you want to understand a film let's say you want to understand a film made by gurudath in the 1960s you want to check out you must you have to check out the background of gurudath 
what kind of films did he make what was his understanding of culture what was his understanding of uh, uh, of society uh, what was his understanding of gender what was his understanding of tragedy and this is where the ideological framework within which the filmmakers work becomes very very important because what what exactly are the filmmakers trying to convince you of and here uh, here the question of the discursive nature of film uh, becomes important what kind of discourse is this film actually conveying to you if it is talking about tragedy what kind of tragedy is that film about if it's talking about film making itself like gurudat das in let's say pyasa or kagaz ke phool what kind of you know of poetry or whatever you know what, what sort of film is that why why is he trying to say that to you or to the audience at a particular time so that background of the filmmaker is extremely important so here of course you look at film uh, the filmmaker as the author the the, the 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 background of the author is very important you if you look at satyajit ray or you look at sham benegal or you look at minal sen or you know you look at any other or francis ford coppola or you look at martin scorsese you have to go into their background so the film historian has to do a fair amount of research to understand the 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 psychology of the filmmaker the socio economic background of the filmmaker his training as a filmmaker what kind of methods does he employ and so on and so forth to be able to develop a comprehensive understanding of cinema and then of course uh, what kind of films comprise their genre uh, can you really actually identify individuals with with their you know with with with, with genre i mean so, uh, 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 do authors belong to a particular genre of filmmaking so if you if you really talk about martin scorsese for instance who is one of my favorite uh, filmmakers uh, martin scorsese is a master of you know uh, crime films so why does he do that what what message do his crime films have uh, for people and so on and so forth so and is that the only if if that's the only genre he or film he has made why has he made that kind of genre his forte and so on and so forth these are the questions which Uh, the film historian has to ask to be able to make sense of film uh fourth sir, what is the aim of the filmmaker is it mass escapist entertainment is it educative or is it political fifth is the film a feature film or historical or documentary or reportage why has the film been made and uh if the film is a period historical why is the period historical being made at a particular given time for instance if you have a film on let's say uh, rani lakshmi bai made uh, today or if you have let's say about 10 12 13 years ago you had a series of four or five important films which came out on bhagat singh why were why did suddenly you know three or four filmmakers think of making a film on bhagat singh what was it at that what what was so important uh, what 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 was so important of the historical of about the historical developments which were happening in india at that time let's say 15 16 years ago or 12 13 14 years ago when it was important for you know bhagat singh movies to be made so if you, if you really want to look at let's say you look at the bhagat singh movie bhagat singh film as a typical genre film which is produced periodically in hindi cinema then you will have to compare bhagat singh movies of the 1960s maybe uh, if there was a film produced in the 80s or if the film produced in the 2000s you really have to go through these films to see uh, whether you know uh, what kind of change in the imagery of bhagat singh has taken place how do these different films interpret bhagat singh differently what is the relationship uh, between the interpretation offered to the audiences of bhagat singh and uh, you know uh, what 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 readings do we have on him or what his actual historical record is and so on and so forth so why has the film been made and uh, what is the purpose of making that film that's extremely important these are extremely important theoretical and methodological questions which the filmmaker has to answer then uh uh the sixth question is very important who is the script writer of the film because without script there is no film unless of course you're talking of silent films uh which also have a script uh you know uh, which also have a script which is basically silent but it has a story which is silent but without script there is no film so all good films usually have good scripts who is the script writer of the film let's say if the script writer of a film is somebody like uh, vijay tendulkar or you know 
script writer of somebody uh, a script writer of a film of let's say you know salim javed what kind of script writers are these people what sort of scripts do they write and because it is the script which provides the film with the language what is the nature of this language and here uh, the film historian has to pay particular attention to the language within which the film conveys its meaning it's not merely the scene it is the combination of the mise en scene and the language and the vocabulary through which uh, the film works and becomes an impressive medium of conveying knowledge to the people that remains extremely important so once you look at the script writer it is your duty as a historian to look at the ideological inclination of the script writer also what sort of what school of thought does he belong to which university did he go to what sort of is he a playwright is he not is he a novelist if he is a novelist what kind of novels has he written if if it's if he is a playwright what sort of plays is he known for what kind of controversies have happened uh, you know around his his scripts and his plays earlier and so on so forth so these are things which you have to uh, uh, has he been associated with theater for that matter is he a is he a primary is he primarily a theater script writer uh, is that a film adaptation of a theater script so these are things which you have to which the film historian also has to concern uh, himself with now if the film uh, seventh if the film is a historical film which is let's say period set costume drama or biopic for that matter are historians involved as subject experts in its making if they are what is their historical viewpoint what kind of historians are, are involved in the making of a historical film which could be a uh, a period set costume drama or a biopic and uh, then you have to see whether these historians are known for uh, particular ideological inclinations whether his, his, these historians are known as credible historians uh, within the community of historians whether the historians are you know whether they are known for known for producing legends and fake histories in the name of history and so on so forth and you have to judge the you have to begin the analysis of the historical film by this understanding finally uh, you have the eighth question according to which you must see whether the film is based on a work of history or historical fiction or novel and if it if that is so what is the nature of this text so uh, if it's based on a novel it is the job of the historian to go through the novel and see whether it is whether the essence of the novel is uh, reproduced in cinema because see nothing can be an exact reproduction of a particular text but if if the truth of a particular situation or uh, if the narr- if the narrative is a truthful account not an exact account but the truthful account of what might have transpired between individuals or what might have happened to a person's life uh, then you can really appreciate that film as a true historical movie anyway uh, from there you go on to uh, what what often film historians and film analysts talk about and that is reading the film how do you how should the historian relate to film and how do you read the film in fact there are three uh, there are many ways of reading a film Uh, i have chosen four for uh, uh, the students who are uh, possibly listening into this program one uh, the historian can see the film as a historical source uh, and here you can use feature films documentaries and the historical film as well as a historical source number one because these are very uh, you know these are uh, you know minds are very impressionable audience this started the audiences often start believing what they watch on the screen uh, you know audiences get taken in completely by feature films uh, they also feature films especially feature films which resonate uh, with their own cultural values and their uh, their social values and so on uh, audiences can be influenced by documentaries uh, which is a very documentary is a very powerful media for conveying Uh, histories of things or people commodities histories of countries and so on and there are now you have the internet flooded with documentaries of hundreds of kinds which people watch and um, i would say some of those documents are very good in fact some of those documents are much much better documentaries are much much better uh, and uh, and they tell stories of certain countries in a condensed form much better than uh, many books actually many textbooks and other books end up doing 
So, uh, uh, in this case, uh, the footage is used by the historian to support his uh, generalizations based on archival and other research. So, he uses the film as as another tool in the same way as he uses, let's say, sociology or data or economics or geography or archaeology and so on. So he uses or photographs uh, uh, or other such visual evidence which he may have. He, he uses film as a basically as a kind of tool to illuminate the point which he makes uh, in his classroom or in his books and so on and so forth. Two, the historian can see the film as uh, representative of an ideological position. So here, of course, if you uh, you know uh, you look at uh, let's say from the feminist perspective, uh, uh, it uh, you know uh, uh, films emerge as uh, as representatives of the male gaze. Uh, from the political perspective, uh, films emerge as hegemonic, as uh, symbols as uh, commodities which promote cultural, social, and political hegemony of the ruling classes. Uh, films may be openly, uh, subtly, or crassly nationalist. Or films could be counter-hegemonic, as in the new wave parallel cinema or, neo or the cinema of neorealism, which began to gain ground after the end of fascist cinema in 1945. So you have the resurgence of realistic cinema from the 19. Uh, from the late 40s, early 50s onwards. And of course, you have Indian filmmakers who who fall into this category for those realistic filmmakers with uh, people like, uh, you know, Mrinal Sen or people like uh, Satyajit Ray and so on and so forth, who began to make, who departed from the fantasy of Bollywood, consciously took a decision to prepare, to, to make films which reflected the realities of the countries uh, to which they belonged. Three, the historian can see film as a source of inspiration for more historical research. This, of course, I always tell my students to watch films because uh, films are a stimulation. Uh, if you take uh, if you take a good documentary, or if you take a good feature film, also, or if you take a good a good biopic, or you know anything which looks at a very important, let's say, debate or a historical event or a historical controversy which happened, let's say. 40 years, 50 years ago, and you have good uh, newspaper coverage covered in the film, and you have you have footage of people being interviewed then and people being interviewed now and so on and so forth. You really have, for the young students uh, and even for the older students like me, you really have a very good, uh, very good point of entry into uh, more historical research on that topic. So if you, let's see, if you are an avid watcher of Netflix, um, Series. There are so many series which can actually make you read more about those events. You can go on to read books about those events. You can actually you can actually develop a very good perspective on the basis of uh, the research which you carry out into these topics after being stimulated by films. And I mean, one can go on and on about how stimulating some films can be or how stimulating some films are. So, so students, for instance. Uh, uh, students who are doing their BA or MA who have not been really taught the history of imperialism or uh, colonialism or students who have not been taught military history or the history of technology or the history of commodities like, let's say, sugar, honey or alcohol and so on and so forth. If they really want to do good economic history or they want to do good cultural history, many of these films are available for them. And if they are made to watch these films, the more curious amongst those students can end up doing a fair amount of good research on the basis of documentary work, which they'll do, which they can then supplement with more films on these things. Because these films then depend on a lot of footage which is available uh, to the filmmaker, which, of course, uh, uh, can become part of the overall research projects which the students might undertake. Even in, the, even in, in schools, this kind of the film can be used as a very important, uh, a very important stimulant to, uh, uh, you know, and an important entry point into research. So here the historian is attentive to the sensitive nature of film because film conveys emotion like few books do. So all those who are interested in looking at the history of emotions, let's say history of childhood or, or you know, history of male-female relationships or history of how, how some people might have felt 
at a particular given time in history, cinema become, becomes a very important source or an entry point into that, that sort of study. Four, uh, the historian can turn. Now, this is this is when the historian, the film historian, can actually become a an amateur filmmaker. Uh, he can turn filmmaker and produce a unique way of narrating the past through biography and edited film. It's like I mean, uh, one can go back to what Hayden White uh, said in the seventies when he talked about using photographs as a way of narrating the past, and he used a particular term called historiophoty, not historiography. Of course, there is nothing called. You cannot really narrate the past only with the help of photos because all photos will have captions and all photos strung together in a story will have a you will either they'll have a voiceover or they'll have a narrative which will put these photos in perspective for people to see them and make sense of them and and, a, and understand a, a, a sense of the past through these photographs but then like uh, white says uh, if you know if if photos can be used by historians uh, if photo albums of families or let's say uh, photographs of events or photographs of leaders or, or photographs of anything because you know you have the photographic uh, archive uh, especially of the 20th century is an immense archive which i think historians have barely scratched there's a great amount of material which keeps uh, surfacing uh, about things which we don't know and surprising us uh, about the ways in which the past might have occurred similarly the historian can himself he can use his sensibilities and from his own perspective he can produce amateur films nowadays this is not difficult to do because you have excellent cell phones you have excellent small cameras which you can use and produce films about urban history or the history of the environment or and so on and so forth and all those things so uh, to sum this point up to the historian the film can never be simple uh, entertainment it's like a you know, when, when you when you become a historian it's like you're you know it's it's like you're cursed because you you never look at it you ne never look at anything without the historical perspective it's like uh, it's like becoming uh, politicized about everything it's like looking at culture it's like looking at society it's like looking at even entertainment as a political statement so you become see it's like it's it's the curse of being critical so you really it's very difficult for you to re even enjoy simple entertainment simply because nothing like simple entertainment then remains in front of you. It's like another film becomes like another narrative or document which requires careful reading, analysis, criticism, and review. How does it revise a historian's perspective on the key issues of his subject? That becomes a very important question. Now, does it deepen the understanding of historical events, causation, and process which forms the core of history as a subject. Should historians watch films to begin with? Uh, historians uh, remain divided in their approach to films. But I find that, you know, the time, I feel that the time has come for Indian historians, especially to take uh, films, and not only historical films, but all films, very, very seriously. So uh, now from here, I go on to two things. Uh, first, I look at the historian uh, as a historian and the feature film and uh, after that i'll look at the historian and the historical film uh, there are two positions uh, uh, there are two kinds of films basically you have the feature film and you have the historical film i am um, most most films will fall into these two categories of course uh, the orthodox historian tends to dismiss the feature film also called commercial cinema as fantasy with little or no historical value uh, this is a very old-fashioned uh, a rather untenable view nowadays nonetheless social and cultural historians take mythology epics folklore and legions seriously in their analysis of mentalities so the study of mentalities is crucial to histories focused on examining social change uh, uh, you know uh, uh, i read somewhere something which the historian g h plum very uh, Never very aptly put, he said, "It is not, it is not simply important for a historian to narrate the facts of a particular historical period. Uh, it, it is a, extremely important for the historian to delve into how people thought and how those thoughts of people changed over time. Now, uh, that very few historians can actually do. 
literature sometimes I feel are better equipped to do these things. And if good literature is converted into cinema, then cinema can be a very important medium uh, for our understanding uh, social change, especially both the dialectics of continuity and social change can be understood by good cinema in many ways. So if you look at, you know, if you look at uh, Satyajit Ray's films or you look at Mrinal Sen's films or you look at, you know, you look at films like, let's say, you have, uh, you look at uh, Bimal Roy's films. Uh, if you have a film or M.S. Satyus, let's say you look at M.S. Satyus, Garam Hava, you suddenly realize that, you, you know, a different, a, a very historically grounded world, social and cultural world of the partition actually opens in front of you. Similarly, if you look at, uh, you know, uh, Dobi Ghazameen, uh, you, you probably will understand the current farmer's agitation in a new light altogether. So films can also make you focus on contemporary events in a different way. They can actually historically foreground those events in front of you. So there are many ways in which social change and continuity can be narrated uh, in cinema. Since there are no bare facts in history, the historian is left with no choice but to take all cultural expression in society seriously. Uh, in this, he is helped by the sociologist and the psychologist. So the so, uh, you know, as I'll sum up later on, uh, viewing cinema is itself a, an interdisciplinary exercise in which the historian is subconsciously in touch, in interaction with geography, interaction with the environment, interaction with uh, uh, in geology, interaction with water, seas, rivers, and so on and so forth. And he is, of course, in interaction, in, in, in a subconscious interaction with sociologist and the psychologist to understand how the characters in a particular film are built up and whether these and, and if he can identify such characters in his life he can identify such characters in society then uh, then really he's looking at you know he's actually looking at social history which is happening on the screen After one can of course go on and on about as a film buff and a, as a person interested in feature films and all sorts of cinema, one can go on and on about these things. But it's extremely important to see the film as a list of social history. So two points, the historian can, and in my view, must study cinema for being representative of its time. So why was Rajesh Khanna an important, popular uh, uh, star? Why did he become such a big star in the, from the late 60s to the early 70s? What did he represent? You know? Or uh, why, why, why did the angry young man films starring uh, uh, Amitabh Bachchan in the 70s succeed? Or why has Devdas as a tragic theme been, you know, been loved by Indian audiences since the 1950s? In some, what do people prefer? And why, why do they remain important? I mean, and these questions remain important to the cultural historian. In this way, a typical Hindi film can be seen as representative of dominant patriarchal values in society. Is that why uh, Indian, Indian audiences continue to lap up these uh, dominant patriarchal, uh, patriarchal values conveyed to them as a reaffirmation of their own lives and their own beliefs through feature films? And that's where we actually see how, that's where we must note how Satyajit Ray called the Indian audience is extremely backward. Uh, the fact that uh, excellent movies don't often succeed uh, at the box office. Because these movies challenge the uh, audiences. I mean, movies which challenge the audiences are different from movies which reaffirm the culture of the audience. If, if, if audiences love films which reaffirm their culture, which reaffirm the identities, identities with which people have grown up, have become habitual since their childhood, then what is it about these films? What do they convey, the meanings? That's very important for a historian to understand. I mean, it's like saying, I mean, why do uh, certain kinds of novels uh, sell in their millions, for instance? or in uh, let's say, if uh, why is it that you know, uh, why is it that uh, uh, in smaller towns, uh, 
uh, or even in bigger cities, certain authors sell millions of copies uh, of their novels. And these novels, maybe, you know, they, there was a time when Gulshan Nanda novels used to uh, really, uh, you know, they used to sell like anything. Uh, Manoj pocket books, for instance, I'm sure some of them were, you know, uh, uh, some of the pocket books themselves narrated stories the way films would narrate stories uh, on the screen. Manoj pocket books did very well. Why? Why is it that these things are important? What sort of, uh, what kind of world do these people, what do these novels actually make their readers enter into uh, and how do they comfort those readers? So are these comfort films, are feature films comfort films? The feature films can be seen as comfort films. What is it in the feature film which actually comforts the audiences and makes for their lasting popularity? So these are extremely important questions which the film historian has to answer. Uh, the second way in which the feature film can be seen by the historian is to see uh, feature film feature films as uh, as films which contain incidental evidence of the times in which they are made. Now, if historians can access, as Pierre as Pierre Sorlin says, but it's very difficult for historians to access the unedited film, they might come across interesting historical evidence, and this makes the film an archive open to extrapolation. Films shot both indoors and outdoors uh, contain a fair deal of incidental evidence of fixtures, of furniture, of fashion, architecture, town planning, forests, lakes. I mean, you can actually, let's say you, if you want to see, if you want to say, I mean, if you want to see, let's say, uh, the Nani Lake, you want to see the Lake of Nainital uh, in Hindi movies, and you start looking, from, you start looking at films, let's say, from uh, 1950s, 60s, till the contemporary times which have used, let's say, the lake of Nainital as a, uh, I'm just giving you an example, lake, let's say the Nainital lake as a backdrop, uh, as, a, as an outdoor backdrop uh, for outdoor uh, shooting of film songs or, or sequences and so on. Mm, you can actually, uh, you know, you can actually uh, make a, a, you can actually prepare a short visual history of uh, the historical transformation of this uh, lake and its surroundings from the 1950s uh, till date. Similarly, uh, let's say you can you can actually use films of the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and so on to actually uh, narrate, uh, make you know a narrative, uh, actually write a narrative account, an analytical account. Of course, with the help of your, help of architects and designers. Who are more aware of these things than historians are about the kind of buildings which there were, buildings which were there in the cities of India. What kind of roads were there? What sort of cars were there? And what kind of traffic was there? Were the cities as crowded as they are today? Uh, were they cleaner than uh, uh, how they are today? What was the condition of the garbage uh, in the cities before plastic? Were there as many animals on the streets even in those days as there are? Today. So these are things, you know, toys, food, celebrations. How were the birthday parties celebrated, let's say, in the 60s and 70s? How were they celebrated in the 80s and 90s? What changes happened in the way uh, people's culture was actually shown by filmmakers? Weapons, tools, and so on. So therefore, the feature, films, the feature film remains important to the culture and social historian, cultural and social historian, two main ways, film uh, and as mentality and film as incidental evidence. Uh, then, of course, you have the historian and the historical film, where you have the usual questions. A film per se, all film per se is historical because all film narrates a story. And all film talks about the past in some way or the other. It may be a personal past. Uh, it may be the past of a, it may be the past of a, you know, past or present of a couple which uh, goes to college not to study but to fall in love and sit in the canteen and crack jokes and you know basically sing songs around trees uh, or indulge in violent activities uh, uh, whatever so all films are historical films in that sense uh, the period the period historical and the documentary command a special place in the film historian's field of study what should his, his approach to these be now, after asking the questions mentioned in the triangulation model, which I have referred to earlier, the historian is left with the following questions, questions which must be answered in the process of his watching 
and digesting the historical film. One is the film accurate in terms of events? Can its imagery be reconciled with a credible interpretation of facts? These are, of course, uh, questions which you ask of your historical evidence and sources in any case. What is the interpretation of facts offered by the film? Is it one sided or does it prove or provide a quote unquote balanced view, which is usually very difficult to provide? What kind of text is the film based on? Is it myth or an authentic historical narrative which can be verified? Is the film nationalist, fascist, socialist in orientation? Or is it feminist in orientation? Who is the filmmaker? Is the film propaganda? or critique, these are questions which have been asked earlier. In the case of documentary films or serialized documentaries, which are available on, let's say, Amazon Prime or, or the Net Netflix platforms or television platforms today, what are the sources of the filmmaker? Let's say if somebody is making a film on, let's say somebody is remaking the Ramayana or somebody is remaking the Mahabharat, which particular text of the Mahabharat or Ramayana is he using? If let's say if somebody somebody wants to make a film on Napoleon, uh, which biography of Napoleon is the film being made? If somebody is making a film on let's say Bajira or Mastani, what texts are being used to make those film, and what actually uh, what kind of a, what kind of a bias or prejudice does come into the film as a consequence of the texts chosen upon which uh, the film is made? Why is the documentary made? What testimony informs it? How is the oral history of the respondents used in the documentary? Uh, does it use uh, uh, does it use interjections by historians and experts periodically to illuminate certain points in the documentary? Does it use techniques of juxtaposition in time, uh, putting screens together and showing people the difference between places and people? Is the documentary informed by critical history, political economy, statistics, psychology, authentic footage, and so on and so forth? Does the documentary or documentaries on a single subject inspire the historian to read and research more? Here, coming back to the older point about film being a point from where you enter a more exciting world of uh, political economy or cultural history or history of habits, commodities, and so on and so forth. History of piracy, history, history of the Navy or military history, history of military technology. These are things which actually uh, interest people. So if you have, let's say if you have a very good feature film on Stalingrad uh, and then you correlate that film with documentaries on Stalingrad, the Battle of Stalingrad, and then you, you read Anthony Beaver's, let's say, uh, beautiful book on the Battle of Stalingrad or you read other books, Soviet books on the Battle of Stalingrad, then you can actually, actually develop a holistic, critical understanding of uh, not only military history, but a particularly important battle of the Second World War. So you have to watch a lots of you have to watch lots of films, lots of documentaries, and read books at the same time to be able to understand, to be able to develop a holistic understanding of particular events. So can documentaries document true popular life because history is not only about events and great men. How is popular life going to be documented? Let's say you want to document the life of the working classes, or you want to document the life of poor women, working women, or maids, or you know, or your gardeners and so on and so forth. How do you do it? Because that is also history. History is not only about you know writing uh, biopics of great men and uh, you know talking about what they did in history and so on and so forth. So, so the kind of history you want to do, uh, your choice of Cinema also depends up, upon that uh, uh, kind of history. So basically, to conclude, I think uh, I am coming to the end of uh, the allotted hour. Uh, you know, the allotted hour given to me to speak on this very interesting topic, on which one could actually have excluded a large number of footage and so on, large amount of footage. I, 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 ideally, I would have wanted to show you a, a clippings from films and you know documentaries and so on to actually illustrate some of the points uh, which I have made, which probably I'll, I'll do in the course of time for a much larger presentation on this uh, on some other platform. But let's say to conclude, if you look at Justin Smith's, you know, if you look at uh, Smith's way of, uh, uh, under, I mean, uh, Smith's three ways of understanding film, 
and these three ways of understanding film have evolved since the early 20th century. A. Understanding films with reference to theories which we use to understand society and history in general. And these are, of course, theories such as Marxism, feminism, structuralism, post structuralism, uh, psychoanalysis. Uh, and, you know, uh, I mean, there are, you know, these are the uh, these are the theories which by and large inform the way artists, filmmakers, writers, historians have worked uh, in the 20th century. And and no social science has been done. No meaningful social, social science has been done without reference to these theoretical perspectives. So number one, whenever you see a film, you refer to a particular theory and you use that theory to understand uh, uh, to actually to create a paradigm within which you understand uh, that cinema and uh, you know you also critique it at the same time so psychoanalysis plays a very very important role uh, freudian psychoanalysis began to play a very important role in the understanding of cinema uh, especially after the uh, second world war and, and some of the uh, some of the analyses of uh, hindi films have been done from a deeply uh, psychoanalytic uh, Freudian perspective and you know, Parasha's work on on Hindi cinema, for instance, in which she has called as she has called Hindi cinema, essentially, especially Hindi feature films, essentially as as uh, you know, phallocentric films uh, are you know, and 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 she's used the entire vocabulary and entire you know uh, conceptual all the conceptual categories created by Freud, you know, things like uh, uh, you know, Oedipal complex and so on and so forth. To understand the relationships, uh, intra intra family relationships, which are which are actually displayed on the screen by uh, you know the social Indian social film, the feature films. A very interesting analysis. If you people can look up Parasha's work on in the cinema and uh, uh, and 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 the impact of uh, the impact of uh, even uh, Freudian psychoanalysis. Uh, on the understanding of film. So that's only one way. Of course, you have Marxism and feminism. Of course, feminism has played a very important role in deconstructing a cinema as male gaze, uh, the camera as a voyeur, uh, as basically a male a camera as an instrumental of instrument of male voyeurism. And this is not merely with respect to porn and other films which actually commodify women, but this is with respect to films which you and me might consider uh, you know, very normal and normal entertainment and so on and so forth. B, understanding film via literary and cultural studies approaches. In these approaches, films are analyzed as a genre, particular type of films, the crime genre, the political documentary, humor, period historical, Holocaust films, uh, war films, or uh, films understood as Othia films. So famous and popular film uh, directors, let's say Satyajit Ray or Manal Sen or uh, Bimal Roy or Gurudat uh, or Sham Benegal for that matter or Govind Nihalani in India or it could be uh, Francis Ford Coppola or you could be Bernardo Bartolucci, it could be Martin Scorsese or you know uh, other famous uh, directors who are known for producing certain, these are the author. Uh, filmmakers and then these are the authors, the famous and film, um, famous popular film directors who make particular kinds of. They're famous for making particular kinds of movies. So you understand them like this. Uh, they you use the uh, theories of literary criticism, criticism and cultural studies, and start looking at these films from that perspective, reading films as if they were documents. Uh, 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 you know, which 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 talk about society, which is being filmed in those films. See film as history or simply film history. And this perspective belongs to the 1930s when the pioneering works of film historians Paul Rotha and Francis Consit uh, charted the dualism of the film history discipline. And this dualism basically comprises of what I have spoken. Uh, uh, what I have said earlier in this in this short, uh, rather inadequate presentation. One, the history of cinema or cinemas, if you prefer. Uh, cinema has a different mode of social and emotional history. You do here. You don't look at cinema as 
primarily as a source of history. You look at cinema as a different way of doing history. It's like uh, it's like understanding folklore. It's like understanding legend, or it's like understanding the epic as of as as a as a way of narrating the past. So here, cinema is then uh, cinema becomes a a special mode in which knowledge is conveyed. Knowledge about the past, about about history, social, cultural, political, or architectural or whatever history is conveyed uh, to the audiences. This is important because emotions and facts both are important to our study of the past. So even if you don't accord facticity to cinema, uh, it is the emotional quotient of the film which remains very important. Uh, and if this emotion has found popularity in the past, the, the job of the historian is to investigate why people have liked a certain kind of uh, emotional cinema, a certain kind of emotional appeal of a particular kind of cinema. And finally, of course, uh, this is a question, this, this is a particular thing with which most historians are very happy because sources remain central to the writing and conceptualize, conceptualization of history as a discipline. Uh, all historians are overjoyed to, uh, I mean, whenever there's talk of sources, uh, it brings a smile to the face of the historians. They feel more comfortable with themselves uh, because that is the way their discipline has grown uh, since the 19th century. There is no historian without sources, and there is no history without sources, and there are no sources without it, without their historians. So, film as looking at film as a source of history. You know? Again, this goes back to what I have said earlier. I'm only summing up things here. Films as traces of the past. Traces of the past as they are found in documents, as they, as they are found in archaeology, as they are found in cave paintings, or as they are found in, 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 in geographical evidence or epigraphical evidence or other kinds of evidence. Similarly, there are traces of the past found in films in which the film itself becomes, uh, or a number of film films become an archive for the historian, uh, and these include, of course, feature films, uh, which I accord a great, uh, which I accord a great status in my understanding of cinema. I think one should not ignore feature films, which contain a great deal of incidental evidence regarding the past, and and of course the film as an expression of what people prefer to see and enjoy in the past. So you really have uh, a variety of perspectives available to the historians to be able to see enjoy and understand cinema and i hope my brief presentation has done justice to some of them and i have concluded by uh, you know uh, concluded by uh, referring to these three or four points uh, about uh, uh, about uh, a possible method which we may evolve in this country uh, uh, in our university departments and outside to be able to make sense of this wonderful medium of narrating the past present and future. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. I can I completely agree with you, sir. I mean, I've I've often thought about how historical films actually offer us a privileged, uh, you know, it's a privileged medium for not just the scholars of cinema and media, but also history. And how like, you know, the way cinema engages with the past, whether it's recent or distant, as something as Padmavat or something, and how it provides us a case, um, like very interesting case studies of how generations of people renegotiate cultural memory and uh, how they understand uh, how the past is shaping the present. So um, it's very important that we do this. We have a number of questions and, um, I'm so happy that we were able to bring this up. Um, I've often talked to some of my students about um, after studying history, working as uh, film directors. And I was researching once and I realized a lot of film directors actually end up having, whether they are making um, social films or um, any kinds of films, not just the directors who are known for making period films. A lot of directors have great deep interest in history so um which speaks a lot about uh you know some students of history having a career and a possibility in um taking this up for future so there is a question by ali heather 
uh, the question is sir if anybody asks you um, that what are your favorite unbiased historical movies um, that you suggest as a model to be followed for making historical movies then which films will you watch suggest to watch i'm sure you knew this this question was coming well this is always a question asked by i mean this is a very very it's a very popular question also and uh, i think uh, we all have to seek our particular individual answers to these questions uh, if haider sahab actually uh, you know he he interacts with me on, on another medium and maybe we can have a more productive uh, uh, dialogue uh, about what he's raised so there is no unbiased Why not on this medium what what's stopping us so what i'm trying to say is uh, you see there is nothing called an unbiased historical movie the question is whether the bias is correct or not so there is mm. nothing called unbiased historical movie. i mean there may be there is nothing called biased i mean the, this whole notion that there can be an objective truth somewhere in the past i think it's a notion which has which has to be jettisoned and it is a notion which does not uh, you know it it does not hold uh, you know uh, actually it was given up by historians across the world 40 30 40 years ago so we don't really talk about unbiased the question is uh, the question which you have to ask yourself is whether you if you like a particular kind of uh, historical film why do you like that film mm. and does mm. that does that particular film do justice to the to the overall truth of the matter which it is trying to narrate hmm. so i think if you let's say let's say if you uh, uh, let me give you a, a small example for instance let's say you uh, you want to watch a film on cuba for, for instance you'd like to know the history of right. cuba and you want to watch a movie on cuba or let's say you want to know the history of the sugarcane plantations in in south america there are many documentaries on that and one of the, you have a great documentary on sugar uh, in the story, I mean, you have these series of documentaries on commodities like, let's say, sugar or honey or you know, or as uh, you know, um, uh, asparagus and or you know, things avocados and so on and so forth, and all these food fads which keep coming up in front of us. Hmm. When you watch such movies, it is for you to then go ahead and do a bit more of research to find out whether those documentaries are actually narrating a kind of, you know, a true account of what happened in the past, hmm. not factist. City, it is the approximation of truth which is more important. Hmm. So, hmm. I mean, does does the film address a range of theories in its ability to narrate a story of the past? Hmm. Let's say you want to, you really want to know, you really want to see. Let's say you want to see the story of. I mean, recently I watched the sixty-six episode history of uh, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, this. Uh, uh, the great, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> the great uh, liberator of South America from Spanish rule, uh, you know, that great uh, uh, leader, you know, for instance, uh, you have, uh, uh, you know, and if you if you if you look at that, uh, if you look at those sixty six episodes, for instance, it's about uh, you know Simon Bolivar, for instance, uh, and you have not only one, you have a Netflix. Uh, a series you have a netflix series on simon bolivar and you have let's say a uh, a colombian tv network called caracol tv which has also done a number of uh, number of uh, episodes on simon bolivar so all together you got 66 episodes it's it's a mammoth it's a, it's it's a very big program on a man uh, who is revered in south america as the liberator you know the one of the, perhaps one of the greatest yeah. generals of history we talk about Genghis Khan we talk about you know we talk about Alexander but nobody talks about Simon I mean, if you look at Simon Bolivar's career, career for he's a much much bigger general uh, you know much bigger horseman much bigger general than Genghis Khan and uh, you know and Alexander put together I mean the number of number of hours he spent on horseback would actually is probably mm -hmm. more than many many generals and many rulers uh, put together throughout their lives and he that and Simon Bolivar died very early. He was not even 50 when he died. He had a life. I mean, he, he suffered from... Con con and now, you see, he is the one who uh, who played a very important role as the person who who led the liberation movement, uh, which mm. decolonized uh, uh, South America uh, in the 19th century and liberated South America and created the basis of the modern South American state mm. system from Spanish rule. 
so you must after you've seen this you must go to the books and see whether these series are, are actually true to the facts uh, of simon bolin are they narrating a true story the question is not of details i mean you a character may be created here or a character may be created there that you also create i mean you i am sure a historian writing about medieval india might create a couple of characters i mean a couple of characters may have been created by abul fazal or somebody who you know who wrote about uh, his experiences and these characters then come and start uh, playing an important role in your own narrative and so on so for those things keep happening the bigger question which i am addressing to ali haider sahab is uh you know you have to yourself go and study and research and judge uh the the amount of bias in a historical film and despite that bias if that film is worth watching and whether that film itself encourages you to investigate that bias hmm so you can read and find out there is no harm in being biased the question is to confront your own bias that is more important hmm. no i think i think this whole notion that there is some objective history out there which needs to be rescued from bias or from interpretation that that notion is a very old fashioned notion and it doesn't hold true uh, nowadays uh, there are interpretations and without interpretations there is no history some interpretations are more credible than other interpretations simply because uh, hey. they are done by honest people they are done by honest researchers whose motives are politically far more far better and far clearer than the motives of mischief makers who want to falsify history and use and abuse history for their political purposes that much you should uh, be able to understand so i, I think, think the I next question by mirza hasnain is sort of related don't you think that documentary is better graphical source for historian than movies can you suggest some great documentaries based on history so this is very similar and i think you did mention about simon bolivar so um i i believe that's a simon series Bolivar's of documentary that's one then one series which you can watch i mean i think it's a, and it's a series which you relish and then you read gabriel garcia marquez's last novel the general in his labyrinth i mean marquez is one of my favorite mm -hmm. authors and marquez is a deeply historical his thinking is deeply historical Absolutely. so so if you read the latin american authors like uh, you know uh, marquez or G maria vargas losa or you know isabel allen you really realize that you know how how deeply historical and how deeply anti colonial their thought is which is very difficult i mean that kind of writing is very difficult probably very different from the kind of writing which you which you find in other many other parts of the world similarly with the african writers for instance they can be very they are deeply anti racist they are deeply anti anti colonial and you know they are far less influenced by their uh, colonial masters and their languages than the writers in this part of the world are and of course i may be i may be wrong but that is what my reading usually leads me to to believe uh, uh, there are good documentaries and there are bad documentaries similarly there are good movies and there are bad movies so right. uh, if you want me to suggest good uh, documentaries uh, Mm, in india i think you can watch uh, i mean there are some very good documentaries which have been produced in the last uh, 20 30 years i think one very good documentary one very good documentary uh, filmmaker in india is uh, anand patwardhan who makes excellent mm. documentaries based on genuine footage and authentic information and uh, who is very critical and very sensitive so maybe uh, if you uh, ram ke naam if you want to watch that or uh, similarly at that Uh, around the same time you had uh, kamal hasan produced that book hey, uh, make that film hey ram you can watch that that's a good film it's a part, it's a part documentary part feature film so there are many such films you have rakesh sharma's final solution of course the title is borrowed from the genocidal plans of the nazis uh, regarding the uh, you know uh, the destruction of the uh, uh, of the jews in the concentration camps but uh, there are three or four uh, there are two or three documents which i documentaries which i have recently watched which are very good there's one documentary which i keep watching which i think is excellent it is by claude lanzman who is a french documentary maker who made it in the 1970s it is considered one of the biggest and greatest documentaries ever made on the holocaust and this is uh, shoah which basically in hebrew Be means the great destruction and it's an 8 hour long uh, documentary yeah. uh, and 
and remarkably uh, the documentary shows no no there is no no footage of auschwitz or uh, auschwitz birkenau or the concentration camps in the documentary it's just with the help of interviews uh, uh, with the information provided by you know uh, royal Hil uh, historians like royal hilberg and other people who who have a great who had a who have a great knowledge of how the nazi system used to work it's by meeting common people meeting those people who had been rehabilitated in large numbers in west germany it's by gradually you know the story of the holocaust uh, unfolds as a as you know as an event which 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 happened not merely because some leaders wanted it to happen it it happened because of a certain civilizational malaise which had crept into uh, european civilization especially german polish east european mm. and french civilizations as a consequence of uh, cultural and educational anti-Semitism, which developed over three, four hundred years and was cultivated by the Christian rulers of these countries. Mm -hmm. So that's one documentary. Another one, I think, is uh, the Soranos documentary, The Hour of the Furnaces, which in, in three parts narrates the entire history. Uh, Soranos was the person who actually coined the term third cinema, which he said, is, this is not Othier cinema. This is not Hollywood. This is third cinema. Third cinema is about the cinema of struggling people. Third cinema is the cinema about the oppressed. Third cinema is the cinema about the struggles against imperialism, uh, colonialism. It's a cinema which documents the history, lives, and struggles of the working people of the world. That's the third cinema. It's, it's a cinema about women, struggling women, who do not want to become victims anymore, who want to become agents in history. So Solano's uh, a three-part uh, magnum uh, documentary, Hour of the Furnaces, I think, is an excellent documentary in which you can actually see a very condensed, well-informed uh, history of imperialism, uh, colonialism, uh, neo-colonialism, and the possible ways out of this conundrum uh, in the context of Argentine history. So these are very good documentaries. And I'm trying, of course, if you look up Net Netflix, there are so many documentaries. Uh, recently, I saw a documentary about the Thalidomide Tal children, uh, which features Harold Evans, who died uh, you know, uh, hmm. recently, in the, and Harold Evans was one of the best journalists of the uh, post-war period, and how much work he did for the Thalidomide children. And you have young Harold Evans, and you have the older Harold Evans, who's constantly clocking in this documentary. And this is about, you know, how you know, this is about the pharma companies, for instance, or you have the documentaries of, of Michael Moore, for instance, uh, which are very critical and very well informed. So the documentary genre, which done very critically, which is based on authentic footage, which is based on fact, which is done on reading and research, is a very, very good way of approaching the past and learning history and teaching history to the students. Uh, only, of course, if, you're, if the powers that be allow you to do that. I saw right. Anjushi's so in the same, yeah. yes, on, in the same, um, you know, same strand, I think we were talking about Bombay films. So why are the most period films from Bombay film industry made on historical themes? They're so ahistorical. Um, once when I put this question to certain prominent filmmakers like Sham Benegal and Govind Nilhani, the answer I got was, we are making films as entertainment and not as historical documentary. Your comment here. Well, I mean, uh... Govind Nehlani has, I mean, he's not really a historical filmmaker, but he makes social films, which are historically very relevant. I don't think he, I don't think he made Akrosh for entertainment alone. So he's doing injustice to his own, if he, if he said that to Nadim, then he actually did an injustice to his own craft. Sham Benegal has made a few historical movies, uh, which apparently didn't do very well on the, uh, at the box office. So, uh, I mean, but this is the usual question, which usual answer which you get, uh, uh, because they know that Indian audiences are historically ill-informed, uh, they're very emotional, and uh, they are driven by prejudices and biases, and these prejudices are extremely important to reproduce these prejudices and nat ultra-nationalist and nationalist histories, which are loved by audiences, uh, 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 you know, who who, as Ray, say, Ray says in one of his uh, interviews, are extremely, who are uh, uh, reactionary and who are extremely psychologically backward and uh, whoever, you know, uh, 
who are basically uh, who basically become mobs very quickly so these are the sort of people you can't really you can't really trust good history to these sorts of people who who are not going to appreciate that in any case and of course then uh, if you're in bollywood money becomes very very important and uh, what better way uh, to make money than uh, convert legend into history and then just write a disclaimer saying that this is based on legend and not on history and then you know let 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 losing on the on the mobs who come out screaming and being for you know for blood and for revenge and so on and so forth and then uh, some some fringe outfit uh, making the film quite successful after we are uh, getting it a, a, a temporary ban on it and so on these are all games and dramas which they keep playing Absolutely. bollywood is i mean uh, i would never trust bollywood with a good historical theme because they make a kachra out of everything which they produce and it's a very regressive it's a very regressive film industry and uh, it promotes all sorts of reactionary and backward values and these values and these films are loved by the audiences because the audiences they are themselves i mean it's a mutual reinforcement of reactionary uh, uh, prejudiced views of women and of you know college going people and of of uh, of you know outliers in society and so on and so forth and that's so why you answered get banned. That that's why and 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 and, uh, and i'm also going to say uh, to nadim that uh, uh, you know let's not pretend that india has a civil society because as ambedkar said many many decades ago india really doesn't have a uh, you don't really have a civil society in the same way as uh, france had one or uh, uk had one and so on so, so let's stop pretending that we are in a very liberal civil kind of space okay on that note i'm going to ask you a lighter question that uh, ms jaffer is asking what is your opinion of a film like mogle azam it's a cult classic it's a period is it's a uh, uh, doesn't see the these words don't matter at all to his ji being a classic or beautiful film or lovely film or vibrant these are words which have these this this vocabulary does not matter at all to the historian let me tell you very clearly right mogle azam age is based on myths i mean it creates the creates and recreates the myths of anarkali and uh, salim uh, you historians of medieval india know uh, we don't even know whether such a woman existed we don't know whether this Our affair itself was manufactured. I remember Amin Saab, Shahid's father, who taught me in college. He once said, "Arey bhai, Anirudh, ye to uh, Akbar ko jab ye pata chala ki ye Salim jo hai unpopular hai, aur ye jo hai awa min ko bahut zada pasand nahi karti, to unhone ye khudi is kisam ki ye kahani bana di inke baare mein taaki jo hai logon ko inse sympathy peda ho jaye. Lekin aam aadmi ko kya lagta hai? Aam aadmi ko ye Padmavati ki kahaniyan aur ye Salim ki kahaniyan aur ye sab jo hai ye ये सब मिथोलॉजीज आम आदमी को ये ये कहानियां पसंद है इट्स अ नेशन मेकिंग फिल्म इट्स अक्यूलर फिल्म इन देंस इट प्रोमोट इट आई मीन इफ यू सी द वॉइस ओवर इन द बिगिनिंग ऑफ द फिल्म द मैप ऑफ इंडिया एंड ऑल दैट सो इट्स इट्स अ वेरी नेहरूवियन इट्स अ नेहरूवियन यू नो इट्स अ नेहरूवियन गंगा जमनी काइंड ऑफ यू नो सॉर्ट ऑफ फिल्म विच विच मे हैव इट्स हिस्टोरिकल Uh, value and so on but as a historical film i don't i don't think it's uh, you know uh, i don't think it's a very uh, okay, so it's, it's, a it's an emotional with, it's huh. an emotional drama it's an emotional drama between a son and father it's like it it's like a typical son and father problem let's say rustam saurabh or you know any other uh, you know you, it's like a, it's like a historical right. replay of turgenev or whatever so what i'm trying to say is that you know you uh, you know and uh, of course it 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 created myths which have become uh, you know which have become very good for uh, tourist guides and so on after that because people want to go and see jodha bai's uh, mahal in fatehpur sikri but there was nobody called jodha bai as nadim mm. knows very well there was only a rajput queen her name was we don't know whether her name was jodha bai we don't know we have no idea so it it created i mean it created an image of akbar also prithviraj kapoor became that he made that fat big man you know uh, uh, you know who, who was portrayed as akbar and you know with his uh, heaving voice and so on and and so on so i mean it's 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 a, it's a, it's a period historical come on i mean it's a period historical and indians don't read normally indians have very bad reading habits most indians don't read anything uh, beyond their whatsapp forwards and so on which is full of fake news in any case so uh, it was in those days people even in those days people never read anything they used to read these you know i mean two penny novels and so on in which also some myths used to be produced so i i mean it, it was a feel good film and that's all it's you could go to fatehpur 
you can go to fatehpur sikri and ask your tourist guide he will show you judabai's mahal and he will he will also show you the tehkhana from where a, a, a tunnel is supposed to go to agra fort which is all basically bakwas you know? i mean there is no tunnel which goes to agra fort from there i think at some point um, you know maybe one should talk about maybe here on this platform about how uh, popular um, uh, period films have corroded or uh, impacted our understanding and built up perception here is my favorite question by anil joshi and anil joshi asks um what's your take on bhojpuri films i'm really i'm very curious because i love this this question how far are they and how far have they been successful in portraying the bihari and the eastern up identity so let's talk about this number one is there a bihari and eastern up identity that is the first question which i'd like to ask anil joshi or is it is it an identity yeah. we have foisted is it an identity we have foisted on them by being quote unquote non purvia you know i mean frankly speaking i am not a great expert on bhojpuri films and i think so uh, i have seen a few of them one of them was ganga maiya tohre peri chadai wo which i think anil joshi likes very much and uh, you know uh, you had these bhojpuri bhojpuri films in which you had sujit kumar and people like sudhir and other people sudhir of course was not a, he was a punjabi he was not a bhojpuri fellow sujit kumar hmm. of course was he used to be called the dilip kumar or of bhojpuri movies but i think they also stereotype their own culture and they also you know i mean uh, they sometimes many of these films become smaller stereotypes of hindi movies and and so on like south indian movies are taken and made in, into hindi movies and vice versa and so on but of course anil anil is a fellow traveler he loves movies like i do and you know he's he's uh, it's always a pleasure to and he he, he you know he's, he he has an uh, encyclopedic mind when it comes to hindi cinema and film directors and songs and so on so forth and we keep sharing our notes on the facebook and otherwise and uh, i think he would be in he is in a much better position to answer this question has himself so maybe he can he can come on this screen and speak a little about it but i am a little i I'm, i I, 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 profess, i profess a large degree of ignorance about the bhojpuri films I've had the opportunity of uh, interviewing Ravi Kishan, and I think um, there is a lot to be said there. In fact, uh, how um, Bhojpuri cinema has taken hold, and um, as you said, um, we can ask Mr. Joshi himself. So you know, they're very yeah, popular. I'm sure. I'm, in- sure, I'm, sure no, I'm sure it satisfied. It satisfies a certain uh, identitarian need of yes. the Purvia in a non-Purvia surrounding. So it makes right. it. You no know, it, it it's it's like the hindi movies which the nri sort of movies the crossover movies which do well abroad because you know they there is this craving for uh seeing something which makes them feel important and relevant because frankly speaking nobody gives a damn to hindi movies abroad i mean uh, in fact uh, india doesn't feature anywhere in the news reports abroad if you stay let's say if you were to live in a country like austria you you know and if you if you were to watch tv or look at newspapers there most probably you would come to the conclusion that there is no country like india which exists because you know, uh, you know nobody really talks about india similarly in the uk india makes a very small piece of news in the on the 10th page or something so frankly speaking it is this sense of self importance this sense of you know if you are a confused desi abroad then it really makes a lot of sense for you to you know uh, uh, to identify with these uh, uh, karan johar kind of silly movies in which you know uh, uh, people uh, do all sorts of things people do things in in new york which they can very well do in bombay or in delhi but i don't know why they should go to new york to fall ill and die there but they can easily fall ill and die here but it's all very romantic and very very glorified to go and get treated there and you know, basically you know I mean, like that silly kalhona was in which it did and of course it depends yeah, a lot on the audience yeah, yeah, it's less, less bureaucratic and probably you know uh and no uh, no group of uh, uh, hooligans or mobs will actually get to you and you know and suddenly uh, a bunch of thugs will not appear on the uh, on the on the <laughs> uh, you know but you know bhojpuri cinema i mean just for the viewers mm-hmm. to know i think what is very interesting is that the people who were who went to let's say uh, fiji uk or mauritius south mm-hmm. africa Trinidad and Tobago, the Netherlands even as indentured laborers, 
actually mm. their descendants bhojpuri cinema has made a, you know a, yeah, has, yeah. has made a impact yeah, it's, and, a, it's, uh, a, it's a it's a as i said it's a question of identity see it's a question of identity and, yes. but there is another kind of cinema there is another kind of cinema which focuses on bhojpur but is not mm. bhojpuri cinema cinema per se let's mm. say if you look at a let's say you look at a cinema called apaharan in which mm. you have devgan okay right this it's a gangster film or if you have a hmm. film let's say not in bhojpur somebody something set in dhanbad of the 1980s which talks about the coal mafia gangs of wasepur for instance no? or if you look at an earlier film produced by prakash jha many years ago uh, it's a film called damul which was based on uh, you know intercaste warfare in the bhojpur regions when you know there were the you know the the red armies were you know there were these you know leftist armies which were clashing with the ranveer sena and those you know senas were fighting with each other so that's a different kind of or you have the you know mountain man for instance the you know uh, this maji mountain man in which you had uh, you know you have uh, that kind of background uh, given to you and these are films which focus on things like caste oppression uh, agrarian mm. oppression things or uh, they they focus on the realities of feudalism caste feudalism realities of oppression of you know of rape and of murder and of the violence being perpetrated on people uh, so when you look at those films those are films about bihar and parts of bihar which may be bhojpur or other parts of bihar for that matter but they are not exactly you cannot slot them into quote and quote bhojpuri cinema per se which 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 you know which gives you a certain kind of song and dance sequence and gives you a certain mm-hmm. identity of the bhojpuri which a bhojpuri person in delhi might like to identify with simply because he cannot access that cultural milieu here he feels an outsider so these are two different things uh, altogether great so we have um, absolutely no time but i think we must take this one last question um by dr lakshmi kant mishra he says the cinema actually provide any source for writing history as films themselves are based on historical or social incidents with lots of imagination so i think um, you've touched upon this yeah, of course, of... I mean, uh, one other thing one, one other thing i mean i just want to uh, focus on that word imagination no historian works without imagination all history all written history is also in one way or the other imagined history otherwise you would have no narrative all narratives are products of the imagination of the past which goes on in the historian's mind the question is whether that imagined past does justice to the truth of the past or not that is the question not to be afraid of imagination ये जो नोशन आता है ना कि वो फैक्चुअल होना चाहिए इमेज आप फैक्ट्स क्या होते हैं मतलब फैक्ट्स तो जब तक इंटरप्रिटेशन में नहीं होंगे एक कहानी में नहीं होंगे एक इमेजिनेशन में नहीं होंगे उन फैक्ट्स का मतलब ही कुछ नहीं पास तो है नहीं ना यू कैनॉट गो बैक इन टू अकबर टाइम्स और सीमन बोलीवास टाइम्स और यू कैनॉट गो बैक इन टू पंडित नेहरू टाइम्स आई मीन यू वो जब आप पास रिक्रिएट करेंगे जब उसके बारे में लिखेंगे तो यू विल यूज लिटरेरी लैंग्वेज यू विल यूज you know uh, as my uh, one of my mentors uh, in jnu uh, professor uh, sabha sachi bhattacharya who died a few years ago used to say to me in class used to say anirudh you should we should learn historians should learn how to write learned prose a history history book should i think in my view a history an authentic history book should read like, like a good piece of literature in the same way as a good piece of literature should convey a very good sense of history similarly a good economics book also should read like a piece of literature i mean why should it be dry and you know uh, why should it it put off uh, uh, somebody who is interested in the subject so this whole notion that uh, lot of imagination there is no history without a lot of imagination there is no human being without imagination the only thing which differentiates you from animals Uh, is not intelligence but imagination and einstein used to say that imagination is is superior to intelligence so i think an imaginative historian is a good historian 
Let's not be afraid of that. Why should you feel scared of it? And the question has been answered in the presentation, I feel. Indeed, indeed. All right, so with that note, I think uh, we should say thank you very, very much. And um, I feel like a lot of history students could actually take up careers as filmmakers, if not anything, possibly, um, as Professor Rizavi wants, um, that the fact that histor the, the, our Indian films lack historical rigor as compared to the Western counterparts, maybe we could, um, after studying history, um, make a difference there. No, I, I thought I Yagan, uh, uh, highly uh, researched, the, uh, the, the costumes looked pretty decent, and so uh, did uh, Lagan. That's another it's a fantasy. It is a fantasy, indeed. There is no historical basis to it, but I thought the costumes in Lagan oh, were very a, it's well. A, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nationalist film. Okay. Hmm. It showcases the nation. It even hmm. includes a disabled person in that nation. Okay. Absolutely. So it's basically, it's basically, it's a nationalist narrative. It's not a historical film at all. I mean, and I find hmm. some of the some of the characterizations of the English in that film are a little overdone. Yes. When I saw that, I don't think it's a it's a popular film because I mean, if people liked it because you know you you were ba basically giving giving it back to the English, uh, you know, in your <laughs> own way. But uh, that's what Indians like to do, uh, uh, and and justifiably so. Why not do? It? They gave it to us for 250 years, so it, it's high time you gave it back to them a little. But but it's uh, you know yeah, it's, it's, it's value of, the value of that film is basically a, a it's it's a nationalist uh, narrative. It's, it's, Great a, feel good it's a Bolly, it's a Bollywood nationalist narrative. Uh, a better film made by him was Tare Zameen Par, hmm. which I think hmm. is historically far more important to understand because our attitude towards, you know, uh, uh, disabled people or autistic children or that that showcasing of that attitude is far more historically, sociologically, culturally, important. psychologically far more significant than that Lagan or whatever you know this. Uh, uh, okay. They had made, you know, this in which these guys go and uh, they blow up a radio station or so. I don't know what Basanti, Rang De Basanti. That was a horrible film. Oh, uh, yeah. It's, it, it's the sort of film which encourages vigilante action and so on. Uh, you know, that's fantasy, basically. It's, it it's, is it's, indeed. it's the sort of, uh, you know, uh, middle class vigilante action against uh, a systemic problem which doesn't really work. I mean, in any case, middle class people don't go into real radio stations and do those things. They don't have the guts to be into it. That is more of a fantasy. But you know, I mean, this Tare Zameen Par, I think, was a much better. Uh, it's a much better film, and it has it has deeper historical. Uh, it has deeper historical value uh, in our understanding of our society and its attitude towards uh, a certain section of the marginalized people. Hmm. Hmm. Great. So I think. I think another session is much needed for this because we need to delve into the sub genres and the cultural implications and the revisions that one has to look at uh, when studying a topic like this. Yeah, I'd, I'd rather that, I mean, as Nadeem, I, I, instead of looking at uh, Bollywood for careers, because it's very difficult to find uh, uh, careers for honest, uh, good people in Bollywood, uh, which is like any other industry, you know. Uh, it has nepotism and all sorts of problems and so on. Uh, instead of looking at Bollywood as career opportunities, I I feel our young students, uh, especially those who are doing, uh, you know, uh, universities should offer more film history, uh, cinema history courses, which they don't do. There should be more uh, practical seminars on cinema and history, of course, with a lot of reading and uh, you have to read. It's not easy because, you know, uh, reading sociology is not easy. Reading Reading psychology is not easy. These are very tough things to read. It's not, and, and they, it'll also help them read sources in a different way altogether. You really get into the psyche of the person who actually produces a particular kind of historical source. A historical no, source is not, you know, it's a human being which has produced that source. So you can't really understand that source unless you go behind that source and try to understand the mentality of the human being uh, who has produced that source. So. This will actually equip our students to understand social, cultural, and intellectual history in a better way, in a more competent way than reading dry histories of these pasts, which which they you know, which they keep uh, 
you know, reproducing in their uh, uh, unoriginal MPhils and PhDs. So, uh, you know, uh, and they can become amateur filmmakers. I think amateur filmmaking uh, has a great, uh, it has a great, uh, you know, future as an independent, uh, uh, you know, an independent initiative taken by students. Because they can bring their sensibility as a historian yes. uh, into their cell phones, which they can use, let's say, to document migrant laborers or working classes or their own domestic helps or animals or environment or whatever. I mean, you know, lots of things to you have to be careful because uh, filming can be quite unsafe in some places. So uh, mind that. So you know. But they okay, can do so that. one last question, even though we have very like literally no time. I would like to know your take on war war drama like Hakikat. Because you have written a lot on this topic. So it's, maybe... a national, it's a nationalist film. And it, it's a film which talks about a battle which very few Indians know about. And um, it's a nationalist film. It's a nationalist war film. Uh, with the trappings of all uh, all the trappings of nationalist. Uh, cinema in it and it it could not be otherwise hmm. Hmm. the point is they made a film on the battle of chushul okay hmm. on on rezangla chushul this is that battle okay uh, but no indian uh, filmmaker could make make a film on what happened in the northeast where the indian army and the indian civil administration was completely routed by the fear of the chinese invasion Hmm. You see, these two theatres of war, the war took place in two theatres, the Eastern Theatre and the Northern Theatre, right? In Ladakh, the Battle of Chushul Razangla is a good battle which the Indian Army fought. You have a very, uh, a very, you know, uh, uh, very bad looking and rather, you know, you know rather lonely and uh, you know, I would say rather pathetic sort of uh, uh, obelisk raised to uh, you know Major Shaitan Singh in that area when you go towards the Pangong so you pass that and the, mm. the tourist taxi walas don't even stop there for people to have a look at that place mm. Mm. and I remember going there in 2000, uh, 2009 I had gone there and uh, thankfully the army had taken care of me because somebody in the army knew me and um, uh, our driver was, was just about to race past it because we spent the night in Razangla and, and he was, you know, he was racing. And I said, what is this? He said, this is some, you know, ya koi nahi rukta hai. So I said, nahi, nahi, hum rukenge. Then I realized it is the uh, memorial of, uh, you know, Major Shaitan Singh. And that's the place where the, uh, you know, uh, Razangla Chushul battle place. So we don't even know how to I mean, we are a country which, I mean, leave alone critically analyzing defeats. I think we don't even know how to celebrate our victories properly. Mm -hmm. so, poor is our, so poor is our historical sensibility. And so overwhelming is the need to conform to uh, nationalist narratives all the time. So scared we are of, uh, you know, being critical about our own recent past as historians. Mm -hmm. So I would like I would like to see a Bollywood filmmaker make a film on the Northeast during the Chinese war. Right. That's when I will say that you can actually make a war film. I mean, you can never make a war film in this country like the Americans have made war films about Vietnam. Agreed. Agreed. You see, if you look at a beautiful film made by the German filmmaker, uh, Josef Wilsmeyer, I think in 1993, it's a film called, it has a simple name, it's called Stalingrad. That's the film, that's the sort of film you can never make here. 